Baptists who are aware of what distinguishes them among Christian believers sometimes neglect to see how challenging it can be to actually hold on to these doctrinal distinctives in practice. These beliefs are easily usurped when taken for granted or even forgotten about. In the 1980s, the doctrine of the priesthood of believers became a victim of a larger war ranging in the largest Baptist association, the Southern Baptist Convention. In a lengthy war that pitted moderates and fundamentalists in a battle called the inerrancy debate, Fundamentalists fought what they interpreted as a creeping liberalism in their churches. The doctrine of soul competency was challenged by individual believers in churches who were arriving at interpretations of scripture that were not as rigorously conservative as the fundamentalists wanted. These theological warriors were successful in 1987 in bringing a resolution that elevated pastoral authority above the priesthood of believers, essentially taking a backward step in the freedom that had traditionally marked Baptist life. As Walter Sheridan says, Baptist freedom, like all freedom, is very fragile. The priesthood of all believers is one of those fragile freedoms, a doctrine we'll look at in today's episode of Walk the Walk. The doctrine of the priesthood of all believers is not unique to the Baptists, but among the larger family of Christians, Baptists have the most robust and practical understanding of its application. Starting with a key term, the church at large hears the word priest vocationally. They hear it as a specific role or a calling assigned to an individual or or maybe a group like the Levites in the Old Testament. In one sense, this is correct usage of the word, but the Bible also points to the priesthood in terms of a divine calling on a group of people. We see this first in Exodus, where God calls his treasured people to be a kingdom of priests and a holy nation, in essence, a holy priesthood. God never rescinds this collective calling, nor is it exclusively assigned to certain individuals. The inspired New Testament authors saw this calling extended to the church, Matthew records a parable of Jesus, the parable of the tenants in Matthew 21, where he narrates the transfer of the calling from one people to another, understood as the extension of the corporate calling from Israel to God's people, the church. The apostle Peter combines the old and new covenant callings to name Christians a chosen race, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation. For Baptists, this has always been more than just a theological doctrine. It has been a divine calling on them as individuals and as a people. The Baptist doctrine of the priesthood of believers is holistic. That is, it touches every other distinctive found amongst these believers. For example, as I mentioned in the last video, the doctrine of soul competency is closely related to the priesthood of believers. Baptists believe every Christian made in the image of God and bearing the indwelling Holy Spirit has direct access to God in every sense of the meaning. This means that the individual is free and responsible before God to read and interpret the scripture for themselves, to pray and confess without a mediator, and to practice their faith as guided by their spirit-filled conscience. This freedom then extends to the doctrine of every believer as a priest, and it involves both privilege and responsibility. The privileges of direct access to God are balanced by the responsibility of obedience to the Lord of salvation, who makes this privilege possible. It's in this moment of salvation where the fullness of God comes to dwell in the believer. It's in this moment that one becomes a member of the priesthood as well. This is an important point about priesthood membership. It is automatic, and it is not an option of volunteerism. You are a Christian 
and therefore you are a member of the holy priesthood. And you should personalize this. You are a priest, and to minister to your Christian brothers and sisters, I am a priest, and I'm an ambassador for my Lord. One of the most damaging things that's taken root in Baptist churches over the centuries is individualism at the expense of the corporate priesthood. In many cases, Baptists no longer see themselves as a spiritually gifted part of the family of believers. The sense that they're an integral, necessary part of that family with an irreplaceable role to play in the mission and the ministry of the church, that's been lost. Modern Christians often see ourselves as individuals first, rarely considering the cost to the ministry that comes when we excuse ourselves from priesthood responsibilities. This was the mistake that Israel made as the first priesthood of God. They loved the privileges of the calling without counting the cost and accepting the attendant responsibilities. The responsibilities of the priesthood aren't new or novel. You've been exposed to all of them in your reading of the Bible. As you would expect, the first obligation is that we must be holy, a term that must be defined properly. To be holy primarily means to be set apart for the service of God. The moral content of holiness doesn't come into view until it's used in reference to God's nature. In our calling as priests of God, we have to live up to that nature. Our character is our core asset in Christian service, and that character is seen in our love. The priest's life is characterized by a Christ-like love, a love we are commanded to show to our fellow priests, to one another, and to those who might be difficult to love, just as you and I once were. Love and holiness are the marks of the members of the priesthood, but we're also called to be people of action. Christianity is not a spectator sport. Believers must be involved in ministering to each other and to our community. Consumer Christianity is anathema to the New Testament faith passed into modern Baptist hands. Some of that came because of an artificial division between the clergy and laity, and it became entrenched in the church. As that became the norm, the laity received the ministry that the clergy performed. And because of this, the division took root. A careful look at the calling of the pastor is a corrective to this. They are not the priests. They are not the sole agents of ministry. The pastors and teachers are called to equip Christians, that is, called to equip members of the priesthood of believers for their ministry. This equipping of the saints includes the calling of the priesthood, which blankets all believers, training that all Christians are committed to studying and knowing the scriptures under the leadership of the Holy Spirit. A believer who takes their priesthood calling seriously will never be satisfied on a milk diet. It's useful to meditate on the question, which of us would want to lose the opportunity to be effectively used by God because we're not adequately prepared? Hebrews chapter 11 is often referred to as the Faith Hall of Fame. The author writes of person after person who played their role through the centuries in the priesthood of believers. Those who served God before us ministered as called to the utmost of their ability. And as the chapter continues, the list of names grows so long that the author finally results to just listing their actions. This is the priesthood that preceded us. This is the priesthood that's been passed down to us. Do we want to be known as giving anything less than our lives in the service of our King? The first two verses of Romans chapter 12 are well known by believers, and they speak to our calling. Remember that we are a priesthood of God, and as we minister to each other and to our world, we show His good, perfect, and pleasing will for his creation. Minister well, my fellow priests, and may God richly bless you.